Matthew Kikuchi. I am a 15-year-old student, a rising junior, from Sturgis Charter Public School in Massachusetts. I have uh, two years left in high school. Along a completely different subject, if any of you need a broadcast meteorologist in six years, <laughs> hopefully I will Anyway, Mr. Mobile did his presentation regarding uh, temperature contrast over very short areas, and I think that goes really well with what my presentation is in regards to. I had gust front related water spouts, and a gust front is essentially, I'm sure you guys all know this of course, but a large temperature gradient. So I think that really uh, pars well with Mr. Mobile's presentation. Anyway, I'm from Plymouth, Massachusetts. That's where the Pilgrims landed. I know you guys are math and science people, but just a little bit of history to supplement the presentation. Now, uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts is not considered a severe weather hotspot. When we talk about severe weather in Massachusetts, it's generally constricted to the western half of the state, uh, half of the state, because as storms make their way eastward over time, they generally draw upon the marine influence close to the coast, and ocean temperatures rarely exceed 68 degrees, whereas inland temperatures can go up to about 90, which is why pretty much western Massachusetts is always on par for severe thunderstorms, and along the coastline where I live, well, we get a severe thunderstorm and maybe it rains if we're lucky. So, some historic storms from New England over the past couple of years. This one, not very recent, we just celebrated the 60th anniversary of the June 9, 1953 Worcester tornado. Now, there were 94 people killed. Normally, when we talk about severe weather, Massachusetts doesn't come up, but occasionally Massachusetts can and does get intense tornadoes, this one being an F5. And it's most likely according to the National Weather Service, Taunton. I spoke to them a uh, uh, multiple vortex tornado, and it was about a mile wide as it went through the Worcester, Shrewsbury, and Holden area, and it carved a 46-mile path of destruction. Now, I bet most of you will remember this. I doubt anyone here. Well, a few people were probably alive during 1953. But, uh, June 1st... <laughs> 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 I don't know. Here we go. Okay, so more recently, on June 1st, 2011, uh, downtown Springfield, Massachusetts was hit by a pretty large tornado. In fact, it was a half mile wide as it went through the uh, Brookfield area. <clears throat> Unfortunately, four fatalities, over 200 injuries, and tracked a 39 mile path through south central Massachusetts. And it dispelled the myth for many people that severe weather cannot strike downtown areas. Now, eastern Massachusetts, in fact, the only severe thunderstorm we've had in the past year was this one, a severe thunder snowstorm, and technically we did meet the 60 mile an hour wind criteria. And I'm sure Jim Cantori would have loved this. I'm sure everyone saw the video of him during the Chicago blizzard. That's why my presentation is on the use. Uh, so, to supplement my presentation, I have three different case studies. The first one on June 23rd, 2012, we had an EF0 uh, tornado come ashore in situ of Massachusetts after a water spout formed. That was all part of an intense squall line that tracked through eastern Massachusetts with an associated outflow boundary, uh, producing 30 to 40 mile an hour winds. The main event, however, was on July 24, 2012, when we had three water spouts form offshore Manomet, Massachusetts, at Whitehorse Beach, which is a pretty common tourist destination. It was an EF0 tornado that came ashore, all part of a very large severe weather outbreak we had. And then finally, on August 28, 2012, we had a water spout form over Cape Cod Bay with three associated funnel dots. So I'd like to dive right into the nitty gritty. On June 23rd, here we go. 4 p.m., we have a cold front tracking out of eastern New York. This was about 20 to 30 miles an hour away at that point. It was a fairly slow moving system, so I was able to capture that picture. Now by 5 p.m. we had cumulus congestus covering the sky, and by 6.06 .06 p.m. the National Weather Service had issued a severe thunderstorm warning for the possibility of quarter-sized hail damaging winds in excess of 60 miles an hour. Here's a gust front. I took a picture of this as I was near downtown Plymouth, and I'm sure everyone from the Tennessee area is looking at this and saying, you call this a gust front? Well, for Plymouth, this is pretty substantial because we do not get the kind of massive severe weather that the Great Plains gets to boast about. So, we had that water spout offshore at at Massachusetts that I talked about. It came ashore as an EF0 tornado and caused minor damage. We are very lucky that it did not cause injury because it came ashore at a very busy place, especially in the summertime with all the tourists. And interestingly enough, the water spout formed ahead of the gust front, and I'll show you that picture in just a second because there was obviously some sort of interaction between the water spout and the gust front, which is why I'm here today. In this picture courtesy of Brenda Willard through the uh, e local section of WCVB.com. Here you can see the circulation vortex actually reaching the ground of the uh, water spout. And if you look very closely here, I can have the mouse, but you can see just barely a pennant funnel without a loft, and there's a secondary funnel way up there. So to have a water spout merge through the gust front, 
that's something pretty interesting, and I think it happens more than we would imagine. And unfortunately, there were no special marine warnings issued for the possibility of water spouts, nor any statements that mentioned the possibility of them coming ashore. So, earlier on, I think we talked about, um, we had uh, short-lived tornadoes ahead of uh, squall lines, and that's not really what this presentation is on. It uh, kind of goes in hand with that, but there's a different type of interaction going on. Again, we have that cool, warm air interface at the gust front. Mr. Mogul talked about very sharp uh, temperature contrast. On this particular day, the temperature behind the gust front was uh, less than 70 degrees, whereas ahead of the gust front, we are 90 and very humid. And in fact, uh, Kevin, in his presentation earlier, talked about how um, during the April 27th severe weather outbreak, the gust front actually was where the uh, most strong updraft was, which is why we have that cool air subducting behind the gust front, some type of friction going on, and that friction can cause a little rotation. But however, we do have this, um, I think we talked about horizontal vortices earlier, and this is not a horizontal vortice, uh, vortex rather associated with the tornado, rather it spans the length of the gust front, kind of like a roll cloud. Now, sometimes we have that warm moist air, uh, the updraft, tilting that to, it's pretty much a microcosm of a traditional supercell environment, but when that warm moist air infiltrates the vortex, we can have that vortex stretch, forming a weak tornado, and then you can see just a little cow circulating that tornado for fun. <laughs> so here are my personal pictures from the storm. We had that uh, intense gust front, followed by the uh, whale's mouth heading over Plymouth Bay, Cape Cod Bay, uh, heavy precipitation core, and again, more rugged funnels. You can't really see them there, but there are some rugged funnels associated with the gust front. Here's another image of the gust front shortly after it spawned the water spout in situ in Massachusetts. There you can just barely see a pennant funnel cloud block followed by a couple other funnel clouds. And when we switch to radar, of course, meteorologist's best friend, we can see a little uh, gust front signature on the radar. We'll see it here in just a second. Here we go, beautiful gust front right there. That's a gust front that is across Situate. Situate, for point of reference, is right about here. Uh, that intense gust front caused the water spout. When we switch to radio velocity, we can see that pretty well as well. And there might even be a little bit of a sea breeze trying to work its way inward there. So in terms of data, I know meteorologists love data. At uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, we had 70 degrees, but those temperatures increased throughout the rest of the day. In fact, we reached 87.6 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But within four hours after that gust front passed, we had temperatures down barely in the 60s. So there's about a 15 degree temperature contrast on either side of the gust front over a very short area, and I think that friction is enough to cause that horizontal roll. Moving on to the July 24th event, because that's where the majority of the um, interesting weather is. We had four thunderstorms that day, too severe, which might even be a record for our part of Massachusetts. The SBC issued a severe thunderstorm watch at 1.40 p.m., and we had three water spouts, one tornado. So, here we go at 4 p.m. You can see that gust front. This is crossing Cape Cod Bay. That's 4.15, actually. And at 4.09 p.m., it spawned three water spouts. Those are the ones, uh, one of which came short in Manomet, Massachusetts. And just a nice picture at 5.40 p.m. For some reason, the five is not showing up there. And I tried everything I could to fix it. Won't show up. But uh, we had a secondary storm develop. So here's the original text issued by the SPC. We had a severe thunderstorm watch for the possibility of two-inch hail, as well as damaging, west, uh, damaging wind gusts to 70 miles an hour. And the SPC even mentioned the possibility of isolated tornadoes. Although I will show you the wind profile in just a second. I didn't think we had too much to work with. So I was actually on my way home from weather camp last year with Mr. Mobile, <laughs> one of the best camps and experiences I've ever had. Anyway, so storm complex July 23rd, viewed out of eastern New York through an airplane window. By 4.15 p.m. we had that gust front crossing Cape Cod Bay. And I'm sorry, these aren't in chronological order right here. We had the cold front, again, coming out of eastern New York. That's about uh, 3 p.m., just like the last picture we saw with the uh, June 23rd event. And after the storm, we had those nice orphan anvils just as a treat. So this touchdown uh, in Plymouth was a pretty big newsmaker. In fact, it was on WCBB.com as well as CBS Boston. And when we take a look at the original text from the National Weather Service, uh, they hadn't heard about these water spots until I emailed them. They uh, concluded that three water spouts formed at about 4 or 6 p.m. on uh, Tuesday, July 24th. Then they rapidly moved on shore, causing minor damage at White Horse Beach, uh, one of which came ashore at 4 or 8 p.m., rapidly dissipating at 4 or 9 p.m. And they said winds were most likely less than 65. But interestingly enough, 4 or 9 p.m., we need to keep that in mind because that's the exact time that the gust front crossed Manhattan, Massachusetts, hinting at some type of interaction between the gust front and the water spout. Here are some of my personal images from the storm. You can see a few loose rugged funnels right there, one possibly there, another. 
difficult to see in the picture. There's actually something interesting going on in here. The camera doesn't show it all that well, but possibility of a water spout there. So we do find some sort of interaction between the gust front and the water spout, and that's what I'm here to uh, try and delve into today. Uh, here we go, 4.09 p.m. That's when we said we had the gust front crossing um, Manomet as well as the tornado to form. Here we go, 4.09 p.m. Manomet is right here and the gust front was just barely crossing. Again, we had that interaction. And I talked earlier about the possibility of a horizontal world, world, world vortex. I'll get to that in just a second. You can see not too much wind shear to work with. We might have had a little bit of uh, speed shear, but not too much directional. And when we put this in motion, you can see, there we go. Here's my personal image of the gust front. And then you can see a few fun clouds associated with it. Uh, here we go, moving forward. Now, so far we've talked about the presence of microscale rotation in front of the gust front. That says behind. There could also be a little bit of rotation behind the gust front. Now we're talking about the existence of the roll vortex. I talked about that earlier in the little simulation. And we'll also mention how the funnels begin aloft, unlike tornadoes. So here we go. Take a look. This is my time-lapse videography. You can see cool air subducting, warm air rising. We have that little roll vortex, most likely associated with the water spouts. If you look top right, there's just a little bit of um, data for you. At 8 a.m., we did have a thunderstorm. Interestingly enough, the three different um, severe weather outbreaks that I have in this presentation all form on days when we had morning thunderstorms, which are pretty much a rarity in southern New England. So, moving on to the August 28th event, this is where we'll prove that the water spouts start from the cloud up, contrary to gustinados, which start from the ground up. So we had two storms develop that day. The first storm produced a spectacular lightning show as it moved over Cape Cod Bay. Now, I was at the beach, and I saw what I believed to have been a water spout. Unfortunately, and figures, I forgot my camera that day. <laughs> so, I did have my camera for the second storm now. Here, putting this in motion, you can see some nice lightning associated with the storm. Just interesting little thing there. Now, storm two, you can see storm two right here. Storm two formed along an outflow boundary, which helped to amplify that particular storm's outflow boundary. Here we go. These won't get going in a second. There we go. So you can see very clearly the outflow boundary associated with the first storm combined with a little bit of a sea breeze. Now associated with this outflow boundary, we have three funnel clouds, which you can just barely see right there. Now the video doesn't show it too well, but this funnel cloud actually extended all the way up to here, and soon enough you'll be able to see a secondary funnel cloud that formed and merged with the structure of the gust front. I'll move to a better uh, video right here. There we go. Why is this not going? Okay, here we go. Same video again. And we had three funnel clouds form, and they formed from the uh, top down. Now, they weren't over water at this point, but I think the same thing that happens with the uh, water spouts can occur over land, although there is a much greater probability of the water spouts uh, touching down over water rather than funnels touching down over land because water is more conducive, especially when you have warm ocean temperatures. All these water spouts formed when ocean temperatures were over 65. And again, here's that image with uh, greater resolution. So we know now that there is some type of interaction that causes water spouts, particularly in southern New England, to form along uh, gust fronts and outflow boundaries. But how can we predict this? Because when they come ashore, they have the potential for damage and injury. So I talked to the National Weather Service, Tonkin, and they really incorporated this statement into uh, severe thunderstorm warnings, talking about short-lived water spouts ahead of any rain or thunder. Now, it's important to keep in mind that these water spouts form ahead of any rain or thunder, because the uh, general public will be expecting hail, you know, heavy precipitation, damaging wind, then any vortices. So this is to accommodate the fact that they come ahead of any rain, lightning, or thunder. And it also gives a little bit of advice to move to an interior room. And that only takes 12 to, uh, actually 14 to 16 seconds over the NOAA EAS system. Now, James Spann earlier, I think Spann, I'm hoping that's how you pronounce it, earlier um, very vocally expressed how nobody goes online to spc.noaa.gov during the morning, knowing the general public, to double check the official text from the National Weather Service, which is why it's vitally important that broadcasters serve as the ties between the National Weather Service and the general public in communicating the potential for damage and injury associated with short-lived water spouts related to the gust run. Now, mariners would also benefit as well uh, because we have essentially the same warning, although it mentions that the water spouts may move erratically considering they're under the influence of the cool air downdraft. Now, this particular warning only takes 12 to 14 seconds, contrary to the 14 to 16 seconds of the severe thunderstorm at its statements uh, convey. So, again, extremely important to have those added statements, and no one will remember 12 to 14 seconds over an emergency alert broadcast. 
if no uh, water spout actually does materialize. So it's better safe than sorry because the public will absolutely remember a severe thunderstorm that produced a tornado or a water spout that moved ashore causing damage or injury and was not warned on by the National Weather Service. Now I'm sure Mr. Mogul will remember this. This was uh, late June last year when I was at weather camp. And I swear, Mr. Mogul had some sort of deal with the devil where whatever he taught would suddenly materialize over the Howard University <laughs> campus. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Over when we, uh, he was talking about derechos one day, and that afternoon we had a beautiful Atlantic wave pattern appear on the radar. This was severe weather day at Howard University's weather camp when we had a lovely wall cloud form, and the video is not working, but you can see the wall cloud right there. So my goal is that the National Weather Service and other states, I know there are about 48, uh, I think four dozen or so, Coastal National Weather Service offices that issue marine statements and marine warnings. I'll try and finish up quick and on a little bit over on time. So I'm hoping that other stations do adopt this system and these added statements to accommodate the fact that uh, short-lived water spouts may move ashore associated with the gust front because I think whenever we see a gust front moving over water with warm water damage and injury associated with uh, gust front related water spouts. Now, I also hope that broadcasters use these parameters in alerting the general public. They need to serve as a ties between these added statements in the National Weather Service because if people don't catch the immediate EAS broadcast at the second that is issued over the emergency alert system, be it their radio, television outlets, they're not going to get these added statements, which is why the broadcasters, in turn, need to be in charge when um, people go to their favorite media outlet for the latest severe weather information. And also, by my estimates, just a little additional fact, I think some 50% of all non-tropical water spouts may form under this way. So we have the type A water spouts, tornado, type B, fair weather, and then perhaps 15 to 20% of tropical water spouts forming under this way, maybe it will be the type C, if it ever does get named. So I'd like to thank the American Meteorological Society. They made uh, my trip to the conference partially possible. I'd like to also thank Onset Computers. They have uh, great data loggers, as well as meteorological equipment that you may consider using in the future. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Mogul. And of course, we have a few clapping children right there. Mr. Mogul uh, helped kindle my interest in weather last year. I went to his camp over the summer, and I can honestly say it was the best experience of my life. So, okay, so I know I'm a little bit over on time, but at this point, I'd like to open up for any questions. Uh, yes, uh, Matthew, first thing I wanted to say is uh, you can have my job in far less than six years. <laughs> uh, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is I want to commend you and commend uh, Mike. And uh, I think for somebody at your age, at this point in your life, to be able to put together a presentation like that, break new ground and deliver it, is absolutely unbelievable. So you. TV actually helped to uh, kind of inspire me to become a meteorologist. So thank you, Mr. Leonard. I really appreciate that. Thanks, everyone.